and I have a feeling that more people will be floating in and out. Um, I want to especially thank the legislators who came and who will be coming. Um, Representative um, Spolchek. Very nice, yes. That's me. Representative Connolly. Thank you. And we are expecting um, Senator Kathy Austin, Representative uh, Joe De La Cruz, and Mike France, and Representative Melissa Zebron. Zebron. From Colchester, so this is the worst week probably to have a meeting. So we really appreciate you coming because of the budget issues. And so I want to make a couple of announcements. The League of Women Voters is sponsoring this. We of Southeastern Connecticut, and we definitely welcome everybody. But speaking of budget, I wanted you to know that we have a statewide meeting on the budget. Uh, it's called Connecticut's Fiscal <coughs> Crisis. Where. We are, we are there, and what can we do? And that's, even though a budget, I hope, is passed by then, um, we are going to have a talk about a budget in flux and creating uncertainty in sectors. And um, the, this is a statewide conference. It's in Hamden. You can find it on the Connecticut Legal Women Voters website. And these conferences are excellent. Um, I, always, I live in Mystic, and I always feel like, oh, Saturday morning, do I want to drive to Hamden? And I, Usually do, and I'm almost always really pleased about, I'm always pleased about the quality of the talk. So I encourage all of you really to get back around and to go to that. What's the date, Irene? It's the date is um, October 14th, Saturday, 8.30 to 1. 14th? Eight, uh, 14th, right. And what's the time? The topic? Time. Time, 8.30 a.m. Okay. And it really starts at 9. <laughs> they have caught me at 8.30. Uh, also, National Voter Registration Day. Everybody knows the League of Women Voters does voter registration. That's next two weeks, uh, September 26th on Tuesday. And we're going to be at Norwich, Otis Library, Groton Public Library, New London Library. Um, if you want to help register voters, it would be delightful to help you learn how to do that. And um, we'll be there all day at all the libraries. I think that's all the announcements. So. I'll just get on with introducing our speakers and thank them for driving all the way down our and having to go all the way back. Um, State Election Enforcement Staff, Shannon Key, who's the chief, right? No, it was uh, a particular legal time. program director. Legal program director. And Lindsay Long, and, and I have heard you've been there right from the get from the beginning of the program. Yes, yeah, so Shannon too. Yeah. Yep. So thank you for coming. We uh, asked to gather people today because we had a really interesting meeting with uh, Senator Heather Summers a couple of weeks ago, and um, I know we knew that she had concerns about the citizen election program, which is what we're talking about tonight, the program that gives funds people to run for state offices in Connecticut. And um, she had concerns, other people had concerns, and so we wanted to explore some of those concerns, see what the information was, and all of us went and we found it a really informative meeting. So this is kind of a repeat for other representatives um, to talk with the state people who know so much about this program. So um, you all have an agenda, and I think you have one too, so let's get started. Thank you. Thank you for coming out today. I know it's a beautiful day, hard to come in. Um, we're here to talk about the Citizens' Election Program, which is one of the leading reforms in democracy in the nation and the most successful, and right here in Connecticut. Um, it began in 2005 in response to a parade of corruption scandals, um, not just one scandal with lots of people involved, but literally parade after parade after parade with its own special cast for each one at all levels of government, from local government and the mayors all the way up to the governor who went to federal prison as a result of what happened with him. 
Um, the response from the Connecticut legislator and from Governor Wattrell was decisive. They adopted one of the strongest reforms in campaign finance in the nation. Uh, a cornerstone of that campaign finance reform was the Citizens Election Program, which means that your legislators here in Connecticut have a unique choice to decide to run by relying on their constituents for support. They don't have to go to special interest PACs. They um, can stand alone with the people who live in their districts and make the decision to run and compete on a pretty level playing field by choosing the Clean Elections Program. In order to compete, all they have to do is come in and say, I'll abide by the rules. There are strict expenditure limits, um, not just on what you can spend, which is the small dollar donations you receive from your constituents, um, and the, then the Clean Elections Grant, but also on how you can spend it. Obviously, if you're spending public funds, you're required to spend them um, carefully and with a great deal of transparency and accountability. Um, that said, almost um, 85 to 90% of your sitting legislature has chosen to do that, and 100% of your statewide constitutional officers since uh, 2010, when the program first began for statewide, have been elected in this way. They've uh, turned their back on special interest funding and stepped forward to be funded by the voters of Connecticut. Um, the way the program works is you have to raise small dollar donations of between five to $100 from real human beings who live in your district, who vote for you. And um, once you can show a basic level of public support, you can come in for a grant and we'll review it and make sure that you really did raise those donations, that they really did come from people in your district, that they didn't come from state contractors, they didn't come from a lot of lobbyists, they weren't bundled by lobbyists. And um, if you qualify for a grant, then you get enough money to run. Um, so it's $5,000 for a representative and they get about a $25,000 grant adjusted for the consumer price index each time we run the program, um, uh, all the way up to gubernatorial, and they have to raise $250,000 in donations of five to 100, and they have to um, do that with 90% of it coming from in-state. They can't even go out of state to raise the majority of that. Um, but if they do that, they can then receive a grant of about six million adjusted for CPI index. Um, the program has been extremely successful, one of the most successful public financing programs in the country. Um, so how do you measure that? How's it working for people? It's hard to say. Um, but there's a lot of anecdotes. There's, um, there's legislators who tell us that um, they ran under the old rules and they've run now. And since the program began to be so widely used, in 2008, bills are no longer called by the lobbyist name. It's not the Gallo bill or what's their priority. Now it's the name of the bill and a discussion about what's in the bill and whether it's better for the constituents. Uh, Connecticut was one of the first uh, places to pass GMO labeling. And the lobbyist who worked on that told us that she thought that the reason that she had been successful in Connecticut was people were free to choose what their constituents wanted and they didn't have to look to whether they were going to have to turn around and look for donations from the big companies that were opposing the late Um Another anecdote is um, the two bills that passed right after public financing came into play. The first was the bottle bill. Um, so there's literally like $10 million a year that wasn't going back into the general fund. There was a very strong lobbyist group who wanted to keep all their dimes and quarters. Um, and the legislative session, right after the very first run of the program for the General Assembly, this bill that had been proposed and proposed and proposed and never been successful was passed. And that model bill resulted in about another 10 million into the general fund every year, which incidentally is about what it costs to run the CEPs. We like to think we 
we've made for ourselves. But <laughs> another story is um, healthy food for children. You'd think that that would be a really simple thing. Um, if the state funds are going to be used to buy school lunches, should it be Doritos and Coke, or should it be fruits and vegetables? But for years and years and years, it didn't pass. And right after the citizens' election program came into being, uh, legislation was passed making those children's school lunches healthier. And I think there's a lot of stories like that. Um, in addition to the stories, there's statistics. There's a group of people called Follow the Money. And they're out in Montana, and they collect the campaign finance filings that dorks like us love <laughs> from all over the nation, federal and state, um, anywhere that they're available to them. They pull them in from all 50 states, and they put them into one database, and they run numbers. And what they found when they ran the numbers of all 50 states was that here in Connecticut, since the program was adopted, you have the most competitive elections General Assembly and statewide among the nation. Connecticut, since the program has been adopted, has been in the top five most competitive of races. Your races in the level of competitiveness, meaning that your legislators come out and both sides get heard and you have a legitimate choice, it's 89%. In other states, it's around 61% or even lower. And I think, again, the reason for that is there's enough money to be heard. There's enough money to run a real campaign and get your message out. Whichever side of an issue you're on, whatever you want to say, it doesn't matter unless you can be heard. And the Citizens Election Program allows you to get a base level of support from your constituents, from the people you will get to vote for and be speaking for and then get your message out and ask them if that's the message that they want to represent them. That's a really unique and powerful thing that's happening here in Connecticut. Um, backtracking, what's the option? And I think that's a really important question too, as um, especially now the Republicans have proposed doing away with the program. They're due out with another budget today, and we'll have to see whether they're continuing to propose doing away with the program. I think the most important question there is what are the alternatives that are being offered instead? Because no matter what happens, if the program isn't strengthened and nurtured and protected, something else is going to happen. And I think what else is going to happen is statistically available to anybody who wants to look at the follow the money um, stats that have been collected or just look at their newspaper and read about what's happening on the federal level in other states. Um, legislators, you know, and here in Connecticut, thank God we have dedicated people who are balancing their work lives and their public service, um, and they're able to do that. In other states, they have to spend full time trying to get people to donate fifty, a $100,000 to them just so that they can run again. Um, that's a pretty significant difference in what it means to be in public service. Are you just raising money, or are you actually representing the people that you, that you have asked to vote for you? Um, and when you look at how it works in other states that don't have the public financing, again, the, um, the statistics from the follow the money folks, uh, in those states, the winners, have raised and spent more than two times more than the people who come in behind them. So it's not the voters who are deciding, it's the amount of money that they have to spend. And that amount of money is coming from groups that have a lot of money. It's coming from businesses, um, from very wealthy individuals, and a lot of self-funded millionaires. Mm -hmm. Um, the two most expensive races in 2014, that's the last race that they were able to analyze the data for. Um, the two most expensive gubernatorial races um, spent more in those two states than all the other gubernatorial races combined. And um, the winners were self-funded largely. So it changes who's available to go into public service as well. Um, in Connecticut, 
young people can serve. Um, people who haven't been raised wealthy have the choice of going out and showing the public support and having a chance of running a real campaign. Um, the last thing is, what does it mean for you as constituents? It means that your voice matters. It means when you call up and you say, I have money to throw a house party, and I will gather my friends, and my, get my friends will come to a house party, and you can collect contributions that will show the public support. You now have the attention of somebody who's trying to raise 150 donations from people who live exactly in one small town, <laughs> and they, they can afford to make the choice to listen to you because they don't have to be on the phone with the companies and the super PACs who otherwise have the money. They can talk to their constituents. Um, the uh, American Institute for the Study of Political Science recently did a um, very scientific study, double blind and um, anonymous looks, and they tried to set up appointments with their legislators. So whatever your issue is, whatever you care about, you need somebody to hear you and to understand what you're saying. And you can't do that without a dialogue. And you can't have the dialogue without a meeting. So what this group of political scientists did was they ran a study. And what they found is that when somebody was a revealed donor, meaning when they called to set up the meeting, as soon as they revealed that they were a donor, they were 429% um, more likely to get a meeting with the chief of staff and over 200% more likely to get a meeting with the congressperson themselves. It makes a difference in other places and the donation limits are so much higher in other states. Um, and even here in Connecticut, if you have a non-participating gubernatorial candidate, they can ask for 3,500 for the general election, another 3,500 for the primary. It costs a lot to be a donor, and most people can't afford that. So the other thing that's happening in Connecticut is regular people, people who live in the district, have more of a chance to have their vote heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. So the next item on our agenda is we'd like to hear from um, both legislators present about the current budget negotiations and where CEP stands. I know it's been a little different in the Democrats and the Republicans' budget, and there was a new budget put out today, so we'd love to hear um, where things are at. Uh, <coughs> can we start with you, Chris? Um, so I am Chris Conley, representing the 40th District. I just did hear from Joe Delacruz. He can't be here tonight, so I'm on behalf of the 40th and 41st um, for Ron, parts of New London and parts of Ledger. Uh, the Democrats are right now still meeting House and Senate at the Capitol, working on the details of the budget. So I will be up there tomorrow um, late morning until as long as I need to be there to try to help us get a budget. The Democrats, uh, the, the House as a whole, Democrats and Republicans have a plan on voting Thursday. We plan on being there at 10 a.m. is when our, our call is. Um, I know I will be bringing a change of clothes in case we're still there on Friday. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I might be a good idea for, for Representative Kulchuk to do the same. Um, the Senate, ha we are under the impression that the Senate will vote again on Thursday. They have not released their official public call yet, um, but they can do that up until s tomorrow at midnight. So <coughs> that's, that's the impression we're under. Um, so right now, I know folks are meeting. I was trying, I did try to get a little insight as to what the current draft, um, because I have sat, I have Saturday's draft, which still had CEP money. <coughs> um, but as of what's going on today, what I was told is, you know, Representative Conley will update you tomorrow when your scheduled meeting is here. We're still working, so I wish them the best of luck to get something done as soon as possible, um, so we can digest. The Republicans did release a budget today. Their last budget did not have CEP money. When I entered here, when I just checked my phone um, while folks were talking, it has not yet been released um, publicly to a format that I was able to access, but hopefully it will be released to a format I'm able to access, um, I assume today or tomorrow, so I have time to review it. Uh, but personally, I use CEP. I think it was a great program. As a first-time first-time you know, House member, it was very easy to 
they made it very user friendly. Um, and it was easy to see where you were in step one, what you needed to do to get to step two, three, four, and five, when you were filing your paperwork quarterly, monthly, and then down to weekly. It was so easy. Everything was sent in emails, easy to explain. The forms were all there. Um, you could upload <coughs> online, which meant I, you only, I only had to go to Hartford, I believe, once to make a trip to drop paperwork off because I was close on a deadline. Um, but you could upload everything online a few hours ahead of time, and it made it so functionally easy to get paperwork through. Uh, any questions that you had, the staff was amazing. And you could call, you were, we were assigned a person, a, a direct extension that you could call if you had any questions on the process. Um, and they were nonpartisan folks, just, you, this is your question, they, what, where are you running, and let's make sure that you understand how to do each form. It made it very easy once you collected as a house member. I only had to raise $5,000. It was done pretty quickly. Um, and it made it extremely easy when you were talking to people. It was, what do you need from me? All I need is your vote. What are your concerns? And you didn't have to ask people for money after a very brief time. And the same thing at one side one. It was, um, I certainly met with groups. I met with groups that fundraised against me and sent mailers out against me. And it wasn't... They didn't spend $50,000 against me. They might have spent $100 against me. So there was no hard feelings to anyone that if, if you donated $100 to, to my opponent or someone else among my friend's opponents, it was $100. It wasn't that you donated $100,000. And there were, were no deep, hard feelings. Same folks who donated with, for me who might have said, I want you to run this bill. And as I, I heard it, if I didn't agree with some of them, I could say, I don't think this is best for the district or best for the state. And I... Please, you know, I'm not, I'm not your, I'm not going to introduce this on your behalf, but I, I wish you the best of luck and let's work together on this bill to make it something I can support. But I wasn't indebted to anyone. I was indebted again, max $100, possibly as low as $5. So it really opened those discussions as to what bills you support, um, and reopened those discussions with folks who didn't support me because they still were entitled to be fully represented, that there no doors were closed upon them. Some of my concerns on the program is I do think, and, and many of my colleagues agree with me, that if you're running unopposed, that we should reduce the grant for that. Um, it's already reduced if you're unopposed. You don't get the full grant, but I do think in, in our, our budget problems that we do have across the state, that's a way to reduce. Because if you're running unopposed, um, it might just be the $5,000 you raise is enough for some signs in the mailer. Because if you're unopposed, you will win the seat. To make sure that you you speak to your constituents that they know who you are but again you you will win if you're unopposed and then to discuss i'm certainly willing to discuss the fundraising um i could have raised more than five thousand dollars and i think kept the plan just as as easy as it is um you know if, if they wanted me to raise six thousand dollars i think I, I easily could have done that and then been been on to door knocking and campaigning and getting my message out Another great thing is, is if both people, or three or four people, however many people are running for the seat, are all using CEP, you're on a level playing field for spending. It's horrible when you see nationally or, or other states, someone who's a good candidate, who whatever party they're in, they just can't get their message out because they're being spent 10 to 1. And there's nothing they can do about it. If someone's raising you know, $8 million and someone else has $50,000, <coughs> you're not going to be able to reach. You, you can't do TV campaign. You can't do TV ads on $50,000. You can't, you can't hire thousands of volunteers on $50,000. And we've seen it nationally and in other states. Really good folks who just couldn't get a seat, not because the other person was doing a great job, because the other person had a lot more money. And those, those are, are the things that you see and you hear about and you look at, at the two candidates and say, if they had what we had, this would probably be a different different election. You know, and I think keeping it fair and keeping it open, allowing young people like myself who aren't independently wealthy to have an easy path that we could simply raise five thousand dollars from our, our local local folks and then concentrate on campaigning, getting our message out, and then start focusing on what can you do in the law to help your state and to help your community is really what we're looking for. Um, so I hope that the program continues. Can I thank you for that? Um, can I clarify and make sure I understand maybe other people too? Um, so can you tell us in the Democrats' current budget or the last... Um, the last the draft last, that I saw... What CEP fund... Because I know it was reduced a little bit. It was reduced a little bit and they not hadn't... Terribly. Not terribly. I don't have that exact number off the top of my head. Um, the two areas that were discussed and 
because the budget was not fully written up yet. And the final format that I saw, it was discussed um, for people who are running unopposed. Again, that's a, in my caucus a wide agreement. You will win if you're unopposed. So let's save the state funds for others. Um, and there were heavy discussions on increasing how much you have to raise. Thanks. So instead of five, again, if I raise six, if I kept the same total grant money, it means the state of Connecticut would give me less. Okay. So that would help the budget. Okay, thanks. Um, and Dr. Skolchek, can you. you tell us where yeah, the Republican sure. budget is at? Uh, so um, I am a Republican in the room. <laughs> one or two others. <laughs> and I, I appreciate being here and being a part of this discussion and certainly understand the importance of the program. Uh, I am a hypocrite, and I took advantage of the program uh, to get elected. So if you're videotaping, uh, if you know anything about me or want to learn about me, I just tell the truth, and that's reality. I am opposed to the program in some of the fashion that for which it's uh, used, but if you do want to compete, as my colleague said, uh, you know, you're going to have to participate in the program. But let me be very clear about... <coughs> let me be very clear... Technology is awesome, huh? We need our 14 year old. I gotta tell you, we need reform on technology. That's what I'm looking for. So let, let me start over. So, you know, I'm the 45th House Rep. I, I, I come all the way down from the Griswold area there, uh, where I'm also the first electman. And one thing that's kind of key for, for the folks here uh, with the women voters um, I won on my first election as first electman by one vote. And it was the same day. Uh, um, uh, elections uh, or, or um, uh, filings that actually won me that. My son went out. He was graduating 18 years old story. Uh, and my son was 18 and grabbed up, it happened to be no school that day, and he grabbed up 18 of his friends and they put me in office. 18 year olds. I have to stop. We have to tell you. Because we use that story every time we get teenagers. Every time we go to high school to yeah. get people to register, yeah. kids to register to vote, yeah. we use that story. And I never knew which representative <laughs> so cool. One vote, Kevin, that's what they call it. <laughs> so so um, I certainly will tell you, your good work is certainly paying mm -hmm. off and the efforts you make here. And, you know, look, I think you get into party politics way too much, right? I mean, the reality is we say one thing, they say another thing. We, we sit there. I think common sense should be the prevailing factor. So I think in the... In the in, to, and I'm not going to waste your time because, you know, we can kind of talk, pretty talk if you want to, but let's just say it like it is. The, the, the Republicans do want to cut this out of the budget, right? And the, uh, the proposal we put out, and I think it doesn't want, I don't think the intention is to cut it out. I think it, it, they're seeing it as maybe an opportunity to have reform. And I'll tell you as a state representative, if I run again, uh, I would take 5000 let me make. Let me raise a thousand. Give me five thousand for my campaign, and I'll run that campaign, knocking doors and doing the hard work that it should be done. So I think that's some of the conversations that it gets a little lost in. Let's just cut the ten million dollars out of the budget. Uh, I kind of can see it being something where maybe we could see a little bit more uh, control uh, on the uh, the spending piece. And that's not to criticize the good work you folks are doing. I think you do a great job. Now I'm going to get audited really bad. Um, <laughs> but that's random. <laughs> In all reality, I think the program does have a place. I just think some of the concern is, and, and to speak truthfully honest, we saw some of that in our own elections locally. We saw some really dirty play go on. We saw some mudslinging from outside the, uh, the uh, program, and that's going to happen. I don't, think how, I don't know how we can establish some laws to stop, stop some of those big packs, right, the big groups. Um, so I think some of the concern we would have is how can we look at reform, uh, participating in the process of this, uh, and not having necessarily reform, but maybe looking at the fiscal piece. I think for a state representative to run, and I, I covered five towns, we covered 25, 20 plus thousand people uh, in our districts. I, I think $5,000 actually, I could, I mean, I, I spent, I think, 900 bucks in a selectman race for, you know, for a couple thousand votes. But, uh, you know, I think the hard work that I would like to put out could be uh, under that $5,000 cap. And I would be all for that, personally. Uh, I don't necessarily know how. How it would play out. Um, it certainly thinks. I think that the program, uh, as was laid out, it is a very well-run program. You pick the phone up. You have a question. They are answering the, the phone. Uh, they are partisan. They're, they're not. You know, they're not partisan. Rather, they're very much open. Uh, they share and they give you your direction. Uh, it was a successful relationship. But I think, from a fiscal point of view, right? That's all I'm kind of 
tidy money back to fiscally. I think we could do some different things with maybe the amount of money that's spent on the program. Uh, I don't think that has uh, really any devastating effects towards the program. I personally, I'd have a tough time saying I wouldn't support a program like this if it had a little bit of a different fiscal note to it. That's sort of the position I take. Uh, I also think that we need to look at the outside influences. Uh, even in my own race, I got a lot of outside influences from powerful groups that were supporting me, probably just because I'm a Republican, right? They didn't know me, never had to sat down and have coffee with me, but that's just a reality. And I see on the other side, there was a lot of support for the, the, the lady who I ran against, who's now one of my good friends. Tracy Hansen and I have become friends with this situation. You know what we found? We kind of got a little grossed out by the whole process. Kind of did. And, you know, I might be uh, sort of maybe uh, on my way out of politics someday, right? Because I'm kind of telling you the whole experience up there. It's a little icky. Because every time uh, we got our, during the process this year, as was laid out, we get somebody at our door every day, a line of people trying to convince you that their bill is the biggest thing in the world and you better vote for this bill because this means the world's going to end if you don't vote for this. And I will tell you, I was reminded several times how many dollars I've uh, thrown my way. You know, that is a true fact. Um, but uh, I think the special interest groups that exist in today's world, uh, not just in Hartford, but in Washington, D.C., it, it's gross. And, you know, if you really want to work on something, ladies, get some term limits. Let's really work on something like term limits. Let's get rid of the professional politicians that kind of sit there time after time after time. I mean, that's something I would recommend. I'd be supporting that. But uh, I don't necessarily know that's on your agenda today. Probably not. Um, but so that's my two cents. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with our budget. I can tell you that it's certainly not going to be our budget that's heard on Thursday. The Democrats will be covering their budget, as we understand. Um, and there's pieces of this budget that they put up that are good. They're good pieces. And I think there's pieces that we can wrap our heads around. Uh, I'm hoping that in the next 24 hours, our leadership gets together and maybe comes up with a, uh, a remedy. And I'll flat out tell you on the camera, I'm a Republican who vote for taxes if I have guarantees that we're going to stop spending, <laughs> right? But there's very difficult, it's, it's a difficult uh, thing for me to believe that under the current situation in Hartford today. So, but if we can see some of that over the next 24 hours, we can cross our fingers and pray, we might see some success. I highly doubt, uh, I will be bringing my clothes as well. I actually have some up there ready. I have a blanket and pillow too. And uh, we will certainly be uh, hopefully trying to do the good work that needs to be done. Uh, for all of Connecticut's residents. Uh, I do want to say that my comments are not a reflection of the program uh, or the efforts that have been made in the, in the statistics. You can't argue with the stats, right? Maybe you can. Sometimes you can. But I think it has helped the state clean up some of the problems. But I just think some of the money that I, I, I don't have more of that organic, let's go back to Mayberry kind of campaign kind of person. So that's kind of my perspective. I think we can do it on a little small budget. It's kind of, uh, I'm finding it pretty nice to hear threads of agreement between the two of you, and I hope that your parties can also have that kind of approach and work, work together. Um, um, we, we can disagree, too, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, I, and even our budgets do have, yeah. there's a substantial percentage of the Democrat and Republican budget that are the same. Yeah, it's really nice There's, together. And there are, even the things we vote on, over 80%, I would say, Kevin and I know we're in opposite parties are voting the same way. Exactly. There's probably 15 to 20% that we feel differently, and that's why different people elected us. And when those times come, we press the button who feels best. I mean, if we're going to talk into that, and I, I do, I just want to say, and I'll stay, you know, I'll come back, and I, I, I have no issues. I worked in the prison system for 21 years, so I'm very comfortable in rooms where um, people might not necessarily like me so much, so I, I can handle that. But it's not that I don't, I, I just want to be open and have an open dialogue. I do have a selectman's meeting uh, about the Griswold gun range, if you know what's going on with that. We're going to waste $30 million and put, build a gun range when we you know, have a major budget issue in the state of Connecticut. So I have to go up with some folks that are rallying up there tonight. So at some point I meant to sneak out of the room. Sure. But you know, to, to that same point, uh, you know, we voted on two key things this year. We voted on the pension reform system, which when I say reform, the refinance back in February. And we also voted on the uh, contracts for the state union workers. As I said, I'm a retired state employee. I did 21 years. Uh, most of my friends and my family are state employees. The union workers in the state are great people. They're hardworking people. I always use this stat. We have the third highest per capita income, income in the country. We're the fourth highest unionized workforce in the country. 
in this small little state. So if Republicans think they're going to get elected without understanding the importance of what the middle class, hardworking union workers are dealing with, they're crazy. Then I get up on my own caucus and argue and fight and tell them what a blue collar perspective is, because that's who I am. And, but I can still be conservative. But to that same point, uh, that was the two key points to this year's, uh, I think, you know, sort of budget, is we have two things that have been already done, have been taken off the table, uh, and it is uh, predictable that we will see that increase our next year's budget the year after, and it's locked the hands of the next two or three legislators, legislative sessions, as well as the next two governors. Um, and so that's tax increases. And I'm not going to sit here and sort of, because I, I, I respect the position we all take, but as a unionized workforce uh, person and also a person who gets a check every month, I want to continue to get that check. And I fear that the restructure in the future, that we probably won't even be in office, or maybe you will be, I probably won't be, but the, the conversation is going to be different. They're going to be really struggling to find money. It's going to get that bad and ugly. So I just, I feel like maybe that had uh, a lot to do with it. And, and to be quite honest, the special interest of union uh, officials who, uh, you know, are right among us every day in our, our conversations at the Capitol, um, it, that, that's a huge lobby group that we deal with. And I think that needs to be said. So if you really want to look at some, some reforms, some of that is uh, also to be discussed. So it's clear from what everybody's been saying, but especially what you've been saying just at the end here, that there are lobbyists that have a lot of power. What would you suggest to those of us who support the Citizens' Election Program? Mm -hmm. What would you suggest we can do to support it and help to sustain it, keep it going, keep it funded at whatever you need it be? Well, I would say, you know, to there are lobbyists on all sides of every issue. So it is, I, I think um, Representative Schoolcheck mentioning just union lobbyists is, is not correct. There are the business lobbyists, there are uh, municipal lobbyists, every group that you can think of has a lobbyist. So we actually have a League of Women Voters lobbyist. League of Women Voters lobbyists, <laughs> make it sh you know, who were talking to us, and so I remember talking to you guys several days about League of Women bills that you guys wanted to have come through. Lobbyists is part of government. Um, if the issue that we want to deal with is lobbyists spending in elections, that's a completely different issue than lobbyists trying to get bills through. And I think we need to be clear that those are separate issues. I, by me taking CEP money and only raising $5,000 from my local folks, I did that before I even had my, any meeting with a lobbyist, any endorsement meeting, I had raised my money. So when we went to those and you go to your business endorsement meetings, you go to your, your union meetings, you go to your teachers, any workforce that you want, you go to your realtors, they have lobbyists um, and they have endorsements. Oftentimes they would say, okay, thank you, you know, either they tell you if they were endorsing you at that moment, or they'd say, we're going to email you. They would always say, have you raised your money? Mm -hmm. And I could proudly say, yes, I've maxed out on my money. So all I'm looking for is a vote or help you know, if you can call your members of whatever group it is and tell them that you like me, I'd appreciate it. But I didn't need any money from any of those folks because I had maxed my money out. And I was proud to say it. All I need are votes. Um, they will continue regardless of what happens to CEP. Those folks, when bills are up, have a different job. And they are trying to get their bills through. And they're all there. It's not just labor. It is everyone. When we are talking about... The real estate conveyance tax, I can't tell you how many emails I got today from realtors <laughs> because it's a big issue and it's in the budget. And that lobbying group, I have a feeling, probably sent a message to all their members saying, please email your representatives and senators. And a realtor is nodding her head because we all know how the system works. <laughs> and sent those emails. They will do their job regardless of, of CEP. And their job is to argue what they feel are the best bills for the groups. And again, Represent I and Representative Schoolcheck have the ability to weigh all those bills and vote how we feel is the best. And if we agree, we agree. If we disagree, we still get to vote. And I think you largely have the answer in Connecticut, and it's put in place, and it's working well. Um, I think what you have to worry about is when you tinker over here at the edges, you break the system in the center. So if you were to go to inadequate grants of 5000 instead of what people get, then what you risk is people going 
wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and not a bit the rules. And pretty soon you get secret coordination and you get people violating the program. You get the kind of scandals that we see that result in court cases that go on for years and massive fines that put a stain on everybody, everybody involved. Um, whereas if the grant amounts that are run under a clean elections program are adequate, then the system works. Um, and I think it's important to understand that the grant amounts that were adopted in 2005 were based on an awful lot of study. And they were based on running the means and the medians and um, figuring out where a a uh, competitive race should come in, and then trusting the politicians, these people that we're trusting with the billions and billions of dollars of budgets, trusting them with a the grant to come back and give back what they don't need. And historically, so far, every year they have, we get 10% of the grant back about. Um, I got it, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> and, and we'll be publishing that, what people give back. And that's because people spend what they need and give back what they don't. And it's impossible to lower the grant for everybody because maybe in a district, the door knocking will work that year. Um, but maybe there's a candidate running in a wheelchair. Or maybe for some reason, television or radio are the way that they choose to go. And you don't want to be micromanaging a campaign. You want it to be adequate. And that's an especially important discussion. And it's important to have public hearings about these things. And to really look at how they work. Because if you defund the program to the point where you destabilize it, a lot of other things fall and it can no longer be successful. And that's what we're concerned about. One thing that could happen is it could become an incumbent ATM. Because in raising the amount that it takes to qualify, that's easier for an incumbent. At some point, you will tip the scales to where a challenger can't do it, but an incumbent can. And as soon as those scales start moving, that opens the program up to court challenges. And once you put the system into a court challenge, there's no guarantee which issues are going to be discussed and how that's going to go. And there's some really bad precedent out there on the federal level. Um, the other thing that's happened is that because of United States Supreme Court cases that had nothing to do with Connecticut or a program or how it was working, um, 60% of the General Assembly grants that were available to you guys have been wiped out. They're just gone. Our General Assembly is running on 30% of what they were supposed to get when the program was passed. They were supposed to have extra monies available to them if they got attacked by a non-participating opponent who was a self-funded millionaire who could bring in billions and you guys were under this strict expenditure cap that you agreed to be under months ago when you had no idea this was going to happen to you. And it was meant to give you a little bit more money, an adequate amount to get a message out to counter a negative attack from like a super PAC from outside. And what happened is it became easier for those negative messages from businesses and super PACs to come in with the Citizens United case. And with months, we lost the grant that supplemented the General Assembly candidates and protected them. So as we talk about lessening the grants even further, we have to really think about what happens, not just to the incumbents who are comfortable, but to the challengers who want to compete. Because what we want for our voters are competitive races where both sides get heard, where they can make decisions. We don't want an ATM for incumbents. So that's one of our concerns um, as they talk about raising the amount or lowering the amount of grants without public hearings and a chance for people to really assess what's going on that will come out at the end with something that could be challenged in court that could really weaken the program. And outside money still comes in and, and there's, we do need to work on controlling that with additional rules. Um, but I got ads on both sides of mine. Um, a group thought they were supporting me and they gave false information about me, but they thought they were my friends. And we had to deal with that to try to get those ads away because it was false. And then I also had ads that were going against me, which had nothing to do with my opponent. It was a different PAC's money, which were false. And they're at the same time, of course, they come at the end of the election when you, you have a certain amount of money. 
um, and you have your plan and you're trying to get done with it and there's, there's nothing you can do. It's much easier to contact the folks who thought they were my friends and giving false information. That was very easy to correct. Um, but you cannot contact fo you know, folks who were not being your friends, who were giving false information. When there's no money, there's, you just, at a certain point, hope the voters heard your message enough and, and agree with you. Um, but without those, the courts did what they did and it did harm people. I was lucky enough it didn't harm me in the end. Um, but I know folks in other areas did get harmed substantially. Um, and some groups sent, you know, over $500,000 in a race, third-party groups that had nothing to do with CEP. And $500,000, you know, will swing a race when the candidate, even a senatorial candidate, doesn't have nearly that much money. Um, so we do the best we can getting dark money out. <coughs> Citizens United, the court, court ruled what they ruled um, and allowing dark money, and it still can sneak its way into our elections. So there's, there's ways we can fix those rules and try to keep as much dark money out as we can, because it's not helpful. Shannon, can you tell us about the proposals that you mentioned in our last meeting? Um, Representative Summers had raised some of the same issues and a couple others, very valid points about criticisms of CEP. And Shannon told us about some proposals that yeah, the commission brought that forward help. two proposals. Um, one that goes to what both of you guys are talking about, which is increasing the disclosure. You can't forbid the super PACs from speaking, but you can certainly let the people know who's speaking so that they can assess what's happening. And here in Connecticut, again, we have the strongest laws in the nation. Um, your, your disclosure when somebody makes an independent expenditure in Connecticut begins when they incur the expenditure to speak instead of happening uh, right when the ad's about to hit the airwaves or 24 hours after. And you have an amazing press corps here that does their homework and figures out who's speaking. Um, so here in Connecticut, when you start raising money specifically to spend in a Connecticut race, you have to register and say who you are. And then you have to um, file um, expenditure reports and let people know when you've obligated to make and not just when the ad's about to appear. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, our, our legislative proposal was kind of... Um, wonky and boring, <laughs> but it would have made a huge difference in that instead of just filing a registration uh, with a chairperson listed, we were proposing that that chairperson has had to actually be the decider or one of the deciders. It couldn't be your law firm's aunt who happened to live in Connecticut when they were in California and just got put on as the treasurer, you know, and we take over 6,000 calls a year compliance calls and we get calls from DC attorneys who are clearly running the pack and there's this poor poor lady sitting in the corner uh, in Connecticut and nobody's talking to her but she's on the on the hook as the treasurer and has the real liability and um, sometimes those people are even the chair people and the real people the real deciders the ones that are raising the money deciding how it's going to be spent what the messages are that the connecticut voters hear their names are never on the filings and so one of the things that we we asked for was some accountability there we asked for some pass-through accountability so that if we looked into it and investigated it and the treasurer was in name only um and couldn't pay that it could pass through to a chairperson who was really the decider. So they were kind of wonky little details, but they would have really changed the accountability here when you come in. And it doesn't stop people from speaking, but it does say stand by your speech and tell people who's speaking so that they can judge your message. Um, so well, what we wanted to ask both of you is two questions. Um, will you work towards or commit to, um, with the current Democrat budget, that there wouldn't be any more severe cuts to CEP at the last minute than what um, has been currently proposed? I will work to commit to that. If it comes down to, you know, will my town lose my town's facing a very substantial education cost, as we know. Um, and it, with all aspects of the budget, I weigh pros and cons. CEP is very, very important to me, though. 
So I will be one of those arguing to not reduce CEP anymore. If I'm told this is the best deal we can get and there's another couple thousand dollars off, can you live with it? I might have to make one of those hard decisions, but that's, that's what we do there, is we make a hard decision. I am not in favor of eliminating CEP at all. And so, you. you know, my, my opinion is, you know, still the same. Uh, I would be in favor of seeing some reductions. And I have to respect your position. This is what you do every day. And I'm just a part-time legislator. But, um, you know, fiscally, we're just, as, as, as laid out here, we're all broken. I mean, our education systems are facing some, some catastrophic changes. And that, that's across the Connecticut. I mean, in southeastern Connecticut, it seems, and not to make us feel, you know, worse than it is, but we're really, really being hit hard. And if you look at the numbers in Gordon, for example, that, it's amazing what's happening to uh, you're closing schools down. And my wife's an educator in Plainfield. They uh, are cutting a million dollars in the town budget uh, out of Port of Ed. That million dollars in Plainfield is a huge, huge issue, um, especially with the one of the highest reduced in free lunch programs in my district, in the large school system in our district. That's going to be really, really devastating. So I think we're going to have to make a tough decision. Do I want to see the whole program eliminated? No, I, I outlined in the beginning. I think the program has a, has a value. Um, but I will say that some of my position is taken by exactly what you laid out. And I'd love to see some reform when it comes to getting the super PACs out of the way, getting the special interests out of the way. Uh, there's, a, there's a super PAC run by Matt Ritter. I'm sorry, it is what it is. <laughs> and here it is. Sorry, it's true. And if we can, now he's the uh, uh, majority leader. You know, and, and so when you see that happening out there, I just want to clean for everybody. That's what I'm talking about. And that's, I like Matt, he's a great guy, and he's playing within the framework of the rules I, I believe today. Uh, but those are the problems. We have people that are sort of toeing the line, I think, a little bit, and kind of dancing back and forth. And I think we need to clean it once and for all. And I think I would certainly get around supporting that. Uh, but, you know, next legislative, legislative session, we can look at different laws and strengthen that and work together. Um, because I do think there's an appetite, um, certainly with the new freshman class of people I think that we came into office this year, uh, there's a lot of more uh, partisan, you know, bipartisan approach towards just the conversations we have. And yeah, I can agree with you. Maybe it's not everything I want, but you know what? We can kind of find that happy medium. And I think I'm optimistic for that happening. And so, in regards to the budget, you put, I, as I said, you put a budget on the table that keeps this program, but doesn't devastate education public safety, uh, mental health, there's so much going on. I mean, the opiate issue, right? I, I don't you know how, I'm sure you're affected down here. You're um, just as affected as you are. I mean, we're all affected. I mean, Jewett City was the highest number of Narcan uses Brisbane in the state of Connecticut when the state police put it on their belt. I dealt with it every day. I watched the kid that I coach football die in front of me. Um, you know, this is, so there's a lot to do and uh, I don't want to see the program go away. Uh, I think it could, could, could work on getting rid of those super PACs and all that stuff on the outside. You laid it up. You said that, so I appreciate you. Uh, it's important. My, hey, listen, uh, you know, I benefited from, I told you, I'm the hypocrite here, because I'm sitting here talking about cleaning or fixing something that really worked well for me. So I just, you know, that's what it is. Thank you. So we would like, whatever happens with this current budget, we hope it goes as well as possible. But uh, we would like to work towards um, working on making those legislation proposals happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess first, will both of you work with us towards getting those passed? Yes. Okay, great. And can you give us advice on what, you know, what needs to happen, what's the process, and what can we do to get those proposals passed? You know, my, my opinion is that we need to uh, explore those outside the dark money. And on whole levels. I mean, I don't care how you look at it, get, get rid of the dark money. Um, I might get beat up when I go back and read the Republican caucus a little bit, but I don't really care because, you know, they didn't put me in office. And, uh, you know, I'm in the second congressional district is the highest number of Democratic voters. And yet, uh, we saw in this election, it really didn't go Democrats. So there's a lot of independent thinkers, uh, just like on the Republican side, there's a lot of independent thinkers. I don't think, uh, I think we get put in a box too much, but uh, I'd be willing to work on anything that has the, the word reform to improve anything. So, yes, count me in if it's reform to improve. Mm -hmm. Some of the ideas that, that I mentioned are, are clearly bipartisan ideas. And let's start writing those down and work 
with the folks to get the legislative language because you know we could do it in short session we don't need to wait for a long session um, for another election and we can start getting some of those common sense reforms done in february so let's let's work together and start getting written down and, and work through the process and you know benefit to being a lawyer here is that they get a nice nice another lawyer like myself at a very low salary as a part-time legislature uh, to work on that that legal right about 15 hours, <laughs> about 15 hours. <laughs> so um you know there's things we can we can start working on now and, and try to get through the elections committee this short session so the bigger issues they might like everything it might take more than one year but there's there's plenty of common ground um, to get some of the reform out thank you for coming thank everybody else money that that comes around you know I do not appreciate when ads had false information about me again like I said they were one of the groups that I did then met with and worked on legislation for so as much as I didn't appreciate the negative ads on myself after I was got the position I then worked and, and wrote an amendment for one of their sponsored piece of legislation to get that law through that benefits our business community um, if someone had spent $500,000 on me, I don't know if I would have been as pleased to take a long meeting or to write an amendment to fix a bill. Luckily, you know, my race, although I didn't appreciate the ad, it was not anything that I took personally. I didn't work with the group um, to further good legislation. But it wasn't a half million dollars. Now, Representative Skolchek, I am um, I, I appreciate what you say about um, term limits and how important they are. Could you talk about how CEP helps bring about new candidates and term limits? I, because it seems to me from hearing this conversation that actually your primary goal for term limits would be helped by a CEP financing and good support of this program. So if you could just explain that because it seems like contradiction a bit. It does in a way, right? And so uh, what I, I guess maybe, um, you know, uh, this is still a new experience for me and being in Hartford, and I will say that the CEP money that I benefited from, I will apply again for the CEP money. Because if I'm going to compete in a race, how are you? How else are you really going to compete? And that's sort of, I think, a lot of Republicans were force-fed that decision, no matter if you wanted to think that way or not. They might have went out screaming, but we did it. And so my reform, uh, or my point is maybe some of the more reform stuff that needs to be done with CEP. Not so much, as I said, I'll support it if it doesn't mean the cuts to, uh, you know, across the board for everything else. I think we need to just look at cleaning up to the same question we uh, first opened up with. And I can see all the eyes looking at me. It's exciting to see all this interest. <laughs> like so, but uh, you know, the reality is, look, um, I am conservative in a way, and I want to see it equal and fair, as my liberal friends do as well. And that's not a, we don't own that type thing, you know. It's everyone wants to see a fair race. Unfortunately, the special interest to get involved, CBIA, I don't care who you want to say it is, union official, whatever, across the board, they come out and set their own agendas. They said, and we cannot talk to them. We can't direct them and say, don't say this or don't say that. You know, so it makes it very difficult for us to have any control. So to say that I allow them to support me or it is true, I, I certainly fill out the questionnaire and they got involved in my like-mindedness to uh, business development that can save the state of Connecticut, in my opinion, by bringing jobs and putting people back to work. That's my energy to sort of have that conversation with those folks, right? But I, I don't see us doing away with the program. But. I, I have some of my, my best friends in the legislature, our folks who have been there for a while. Uh, one of the, the women who have been there for since they she was there when they brought the income tax, you know, that one. And I needed to know how do I file an amendment? How do I get this great idea I want that the, the chair isn't really as nearly as excited about it as I am, which happens a bit um, in legislature. She was who I went to. Um, and she I was there one day where she missed a couple of votes um, because she had a constituent in her town that had an addiction problem and couldn't get into rehab. And she, instead of coming to vote, got someone to rehab. She does an excellent job for her community and has been there for many years. And, 
and will probably be there for many more years. And if I lived in her town, I'd probably vote for her too. Um, but she's a great person. And the thing that I worry with the concept of term limits is she has every right to have that seat as long as the people elect her. And she's doing a great job not only for her constituents, she's doing a great job for the freshmen and the young people. And even she, I witnessed her helping a more senior member get a bill through. Um, to make sure that those bills get through that are very important to everyone's community. And when you have a senior person taking that leadership role for everyone, they certainly deserve to be in that seat. And if she wants to be there for 10 or 20 more years, God willing, I hope she stays there. Um, but again, you know, there's 151 folks. And if you point to a different person at a different seat, I don't care what side of the aisle, and you say, what did they do for their constituents? There might be some out of those 151 folks who you don't have a lot to say about. Their constituents need to vote them out. You know, I look federally, I'm glad we have an eight-year term for the presidency because that's that one and, you know, needs an eight-year term. But you look at Congressman Courtney, I don't want him going anywhere to help us in southeastern Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I want him holding that seat as long as he can because um, he helps us greatly. So I'm not in favor of term limits in the state of Connecticut. If we want to do a governorship term limit, I would consider it. Um, usually those folks don't stay in those seats very long anyway because of how the tides turn and what a difficult job it is. But I, I do really appreciate the senior members and how they've took me under their wing to help me when I needed help um, and how hopefully they will continue to do that. And then when the, I will not be a freshman next time, plan on taking whoever needs to be taken under my wing and share what knowledge I have to them. And as long as people want me to be in the seat, I'll be in the seat. And if folks change their minds, then I appreciate however many years of service I've had. There's another question over here. First, I'd like to thank uh, the representatives, uh, legal and voters, and um, you know, support of the CP. Um, I have a question. I learned a lot of this from all you guys. Um, so similar, I've mentioned, uh, similar to how um, lobbies aren't a problem, the money is, I feel like the term limit isn't a problem, a non-representative democracy is, right? Um, so uh, Rep Representative uh, Kevin, you mentioned term limits. Um, I was wondering, so, Long, uh, legislators who have been in office um, for several terms, I feel like have more connections um, to raise money, have more uh, sight, you know, visibility, um, just for being in office. Um, wouldn't you agree that the CPE helps level the playing field um, for someone who's more of a grassroot, um, has popular within the community, um, that would kind of help them um, get that bump? In, in funding to at least compete in an election? Yeah, I, I don't argue the concept here, I mean, 100%. It does, I mean, it certainly does. And, and, and so, I mean, when I talk about sort of the reform piece, it obviously clearly doesn't uh, uh, get a lot of support, and I respect that, uh, of some cut, cutting the, the amount of money that is given to us. And I, I use 5,000 as a starting point, you know, I'm, I'm a big negotiator, so, you know, whatever. You, if it's cut it down, it's 28,000 we get after 5,000. Once it's adjusted. Once it's adjusted. So, I mean, cut it down to 10,000, 15,000. Um, I, I just think that, you know, and that's not, not a lot um, to, to, to move. Um, I really do have a problem because I kind of go back to the local. I, I have an issue. I'm a first selectman. So I ran these local races, and I just love the going and having coffee at people's houses type thing. So I think I can do it, and <laughs> that's why I kind of talk that way. But I know it's not realistic to your points. But... Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't ar argue that it helps get the next generation of people in there. I'm not arguing that. Another? So, so I kind of want to button down on this set through with you, uh, Representative Skolczak. How does cutting uh, grants help uh, diversify or help our representative government if, like, like my colleague, uh, my, my friend was saying, if you are making it more difficult for people to raise money against an incumbent, how does that help uh, reduce the um, uh, unending, uh, you know, uh, 20 terms or, you know, yeah. five, five, six, I mean, again, it, 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 makes it, it, makes it, it makes it more difficult for someone who's challenging an incumbent yeah. to actually challenge them. If you're going to be cutting um, their funding by, by their grant funding by any amount, whether it's, you know, ten thousand dollars or twenty dollars, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think it probably would make it a little difficult, more difficult, if presuming both candidates qualify. Now, maybe maybe we should have a law that mandates this is the only way you can run. 
you get 5,000, 10,000. That's not But my point to that is, I agree with you. What your your point is, I still think that we could do it on a more a, a lower level of funding, uh, allowing us, and it has to come paired up with getting the black dark money, black horses out of the room who come in in the middle of the night and drop leaflets about her or about me, and they, you got to get them all out of there. I clean it all up together, right. and maybe that's a. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a, living in some kind of, you know, yeah. fairy tale, <laughs> but that's kind of the dream I guess I would have. I guess I, I, if I could, I, another question for the, the, the regu uh, I don't know if I call you the regulators, <laughs> what, do I, what do I call you, um, the administrative <laughs> officials, um, is, is uh, the, the constitutional decisions, is that what makes it difficult to um, regulate what types of information are, are allowed and the, 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 bun, the money that's spent on them, is, the, is that what makes it so difficult to... Absolutely. Uh, and, and honestly, you don't want to stop speech, right? Right. You want everybody to have a voice. Whether you agree with them or not, you want everybody to be heard. And that's not what we regulate. We don't regulate speech. We regulate expenditures and contributions. And... Um, you're allowed to spend as much as you want. You're allowed to come together and join your money together. Um, but back in the 70s, there was a United States Supreme Court case, Buckley, that said you can regulate and limit contributions because that has a corrupting influence. If you're asking for money at the same time that you're asking for a vote, you know, that's going to have an effect on things. And so we do have contribution limits. But in talking about like the independent spenders, there are limits on what they can do. They can't coordinate. They have to be truly and wholly independent mm -hmm. from the candidate. If they're talking about, if you vote for me, I'll do this, like you said, uh, that's not good. <laughs> and, and the proposals that we have, we have very strong laws in Connecticut, don't get me wrong, but the proposals that we had took the best thinking on the federal level um, coordinated spender language that they came up through national think tanks and we proposed bringing it here for the last two or three years saying hey let's draw some very clear bright lines your mom not an independent spender if your mom starts a super PAC not an independent spender if six months ago you started a super PAC or a charity and it's going to spend on you not independent. I mean, these are very simple things. But at the same time, because of what's happening on the federal level and in the paper, you have a massive amount of confusion out there. And we have very good attorneys calling and saying, my client's daughter is thinking about running. And he's wondering if he should register the super PAC now to support her. And you're just like, really? No, no, he shouldn't. Not here. <laughs> Not here, right? Please. Um, because of the CEP, because it's voluntary, because there are options, because of our already strong laws, we have so many fewer problems than other places. And the proposals that we've been bringing forward, the proposals that we hope to work with you guys on, are to increase the disclosure and the transparency so that people can make better decisions about what they hear. We can't stop what people hear, nor would we want to stop messaging. But what we want to do is make it possible for people to know who's speaking to them so that they can maybe judge why and decide how much they want to listen to that message. I want to, um, I think we're going to wrap it up because I know that the Senate school isn't school. It's been said seven different ways. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that battle my whole life. Kevin's on it, but school check. Yeah. Okay, it needs to go. Uh, I'm going to let you go and thank everybody for coming and let those who uh, are, can remain continue the conversation. But I am so pleased that we got a representative from each party yeah, who look like they are really interested in working together. And I'm going to come back if you ever want us back, so we be happy to. All right. And, and certainly thank you guys for working nights, and I know you don't have to do this and come down. And Questions? One more question. We have one more question if people want to just listen.
This is a big one. I don't understand how anybody could Someone say such going. rotten things about it, but there was an op-ed in the Hartford Current on Sunday. This columnist says that uh, we should get rid of this threat while we're still allowed to talk about it. He says that uh, this is um, Kevin Rennie, a former lawyer and former Republican state legislator. He says it's a... Um, Let's see. Raising, by raising contributions of $100 or less, they received loads of public funds under this generous scheme. The thing is that he seems to be kind of alluding two things, because um, what does the State Elections Enforcement Commission have to do with CEP? Do they administer it? That is you. Well, he claims that you're um, obstructing free speech. Uh, now, I think he's throwing the baby out of the bathwater. If he's got some free speech issues, it seemed like he was not exactly addressing that. We don't regulate speech. We do require that if you come in and you raise five to $100 from your constituents to run your race, that the public funds that you accept are spent on your race. So one of the big concerns that a lot of people on both sides of the aisle are expressing, and part of our transparency initiative with consultants, is whether or not the money that's being given to people for their race is being spent on their race. And so the case that, the enforcement case that he is reacting to that was before my agency um, was a situation where candidates had used money that was given to them for legislative races and um, used that for a mailer that 50% of it was an, uh, a statement on the gubernatorial race. And so for us, the issue wasn't um, whether you could talk about another race or how you felt about the governor. It wasn't a speech issue. It was a money issue. So if you take money for your race, you spend it on your race. If you want to put out a mailer like that, that's fine. You need to just make sure that the mailer is paid for by the appropriate people with the appropriate money. So for example, 369 pounds 369 in Connecticut. 369 They've all got town committees. We've got a state central party. Any one of them could have done a joint expenditure with them and paid for the portion of the mailer that was speaking about the governor's race. So it, it was for our agency a question of administering the CEP and making that the, sure that the CEP money was spent on the CEP race for which the candidate had qualified. Well, so he wants to dump the whole CEP. Of course he does. does. Yes. Yes. So today, I am representing myself and Joe Delacruz. I can do that as a human being, but if I wanted to send a mailer that talked mm -hmm. about myself and Joe Delacruz, or he wanted to send a mailer that talked about him and I, we would both have to contribute towards that. I couldn't 100% pay for that mailer, and neither could he. That's against the rules. The rules are spelled out when you sign and say, I, I elect to participate in the program. And there were two people that I see... see, see Things did not participate correctly in the rules, um, and they have a lawsuit, and they're entitled to their litigation. Yeah. Um, but just because there's a conflict that some representative feels that they filed the rules correctly doesn't mean we should get rid of the program. You know, there are other concerns that that folks have had. Um, you know, that their folks have been upset when their opponent is not in CEP, and you're limited to a certain amount of money if your opponent can raise more money. That is a problem. Luckily, I didn't have that problem, and you know, if Representative Schooltrack runs again under CEP, his opponent won't have that problem. But when both people are running, you have under the program, you have a certain amount of money, and if you want to spend it all on mailers, you can. If you want to spend it all on TV ads, you can. If you want to spend it all on, you know, buying yourself a bunch of shoes because you've door knocked so much you've run out of shoes, you can do that too. You can't do that. You <laughs> How you deem is best for your race and you're right. limited and you can't outspend each other you know you can choose to spend it differently but you have your message and you you craft your message that you think works best for your for your area and you put it out there and at the end of the day CEP doesn't vote for you you get your message out to people and those folks vote for you and then when you get the spot you do the best you can you, you know you, you we had this discussion with Senator Summers and 
it was so different to me. And I think I'm learning all sorts of other things from this discussion than from that one. So that's been great. We're going to have one more question, and then we're going to um, say goodbye and hope that you take some um, goodies and look at some of the papers in the back. Did you have one, too? No, I just had a question about who's going to write a rebuttal for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got, that. Okay, got that. Okay, we got that covered. Yeah, we're going to send them out to from legal women's writers. Well. Right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So there was also another one in the Republican American Waterbury paper okay. today that just came out that was all another thing. A similar, but you want to dump the whole thing because of whatever? Yeah, I, I don't remember. It was just criticizing the whole program. Okay. Thank you. One more question? So I understand that. Um, the, the CEP allows a particular candidate to return money that they don't end up using, which is really good. Um, what what <coughs> is um, the CEP rules for a candidate that is running unopposed? Okay, so when a candidate is unopposed right now under the current law, they can um, raise up to $5,000 um, if they're running for representative, for example and they can um, file an intent to abide, which says I intend to obey the rules, and they can keep raising and never come in for a grant but participate. Um, or they can choose to come in for a grant and I think they get another $10,000 adjusted for CPI, um, and then they have that expenditure limit. Our concern with the unopposed grant legislation that's happening now is simply that it's done right because in Connecticut, you may not be opposed by the other major party and you'll know that sometime in June. Um, but there can be petitioning <coughs> parties that come on very late in the race and there can be minor parties that come on relatively late in the race. And so what we hope doesn't happen is that the ability to participate in the program doesn't go away, that um, we've drafted legislation and, and shared it with people. If they want to get rid of the $10,000 grant for budgetary reasons, mm -hmm. that they still allow people to come into the program, raise in amounts of five to 100 from um, clean election sources, keep raising and spending, but then, if they end up opposed by a minor party candidate or a petitioning candidate sometime late in August or September out of nowhere, they'll still, and those people have the right to come in and, and apply for a grant. These people over here will also have a right to apply for a grant and they won't be kicked out of the program and declared non-participating back in June mm -hmm. and then suddenly have a very real, very funded opponent. So we've proposed language, and our hope is just that, um, not that the unopposed grants remain so much, that's for the legislature to decide, and it's a difficult decision, but that if they choose to get rid of those grants, that they still allow people to participate and safely remain in the program so that they can participate right. much later if that contingency comes up. Right. So, the, so the grant would then in turn come into effect as soon as they're opposed? later in the stage? So we have what's called um, LAPIGs, Lesser Applicable Grant <laughs> Amount. So you get like the least amount of a grant that you're clearly entitled to. So if you come in, in you know, the first day in May, we don't know if you're the party's choice at, or if you're going to have a primary or if you're the party's only choice and you're going straight to general election. So what we do is we give you the least amount of grant that you might get, and then we adjust it up over time depending on what happens. Mm -hmm. So let's say you come in and you're the candidate that got um, the party's vote, um, at, we will give you an unopposed grant, and then somebody signs up for a primary and you're in the prime, a party dominant primary, you're going to get a primary grant when it becomes clear that they've gained valid access, you'll get a grant based on that, knowing that you're going into the primary. And then if you win the primary, you automatically get a general election grant and it rolls over. Okay. Well, Shannon and Lindsay and Representative Conley, thank you for coming. Thank everybody else.